we'll see. Okay. Mason Weems. Mason Weems is the person who gave us the cherry tree uh, story. Uh, real quick, you know what? I'm going to answer Matt's question real quick before we move on. No, that's not her picture. She has no known image. That is a random silhouette of a female from the 18th century. Uh, good question, Matt. Unfortunately, many of the women we talk about uh, does not do not have silhouettes. In fact, if you, if you notice, you may have noticed when I was talking to... Um, uh, was it uh, um, Dr. A uh, Professor Allison this weekend about this week about um, Deborah Sampson? I actually used the same generic women's silhouette image for Deborah Sampson because she also doesn't have an image that we know about. So, all right, good question. Thank you for calling me out. Mason Locke Weems. Mason Locke Weems is famous for being the person who gave us the George Washington chopping down the cherry tree story. Now, we are going to get to that, but before we get to that part of his life, we're going to talk about the beginning of his life. Mason Weems doesn't fight in the Revolutionary War, but by around the end of the war, he actually goes to Europe to study and be ordained as a preacher because he wants to uh, profess, uh, he wants to sermonize congregations on behalf of the Lord. Uh, now, he goes to Europe and runs into a little bit of trouble. You see, many people were Anglican, which meant they were part of the Church of England, and uh, unfortunately, when the Americans threw off England, uh, they kind of threw the church with it. Not necessarily on purpose, but the Church of England demanded that you take a loyalty oath to the King of England if you wanted to be ordained. And, well, most of these people who were throwing off the King of England didn't want to take a loyalty oath to the King of England, as you might imagine. And this becomes a little bit tricky. Now, I am not very thoroughly versed on... Uh, on scholarship regarding religion at the time. But my understanding is one of the major reasons the Episcopalian denomination was created, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I have asked a few people about this, uh, one of the major reasons the Episcopalian religion was created was because the Americans didn't want to take an oath to the King of England, but they did believe essentially everything else. <laughs> so... Uh, Mason Weems is one of the people who finds himself in this position. He goes over to Europe and he's trying to get ordained as an Anglican minister. But unfortunately, no one wants to do that if he can't be, uh, t if he doesn't take an oath of loyalty to the king. So he contacts many people who are already in Europe, including John Adams, who's pretty helpful, Benjamin Franklin, who doesn't help out very much, uh, and, and Samuel Chase, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, who just essentially happened to be there on business. And they come up with the idea, hey, maybe I go, maybe Mason Weems and, and a few other people could go to the Netherlands and be ordained there. Or maybe Sweden. Maybe we can get ordained in Sweden. And all these ideas are floated, but still, since essentially, again, this is a gross generalization, but essentially one of the major reasons the, the Church of England was created was because King Henry VIII, several decades earlier, didn't, you know, wanted to get a divorce, it's, uh, famously. Uh, and because of this, the Church of England wasn't really practiced in anywhere other than Great Britain. Um, so it was very hard. They, no one could really officially ordain him. They were primarily Catholic, although, to be fair, denominations had spread out. Uh, for example, you know, you, you look at the, the Puritans, essentially, before the American Revolution. You know, they didn't just go straight from England to the United States. They went to Netherlands first, I believe. And the Mennonites went to Sweden first and then Germany before coming to the United States. So uh, certain denominations of religions that were not just Catholicism had made their way to the continent by this point, but it wasn't precisely the same religion. Now, after about a year of negotiation and trying to find a way around this, uh, the Treaty of Paris is signed, uh, and as ratification approaches, they're essentially like, well, we do want everyone to be able to practice their religion. Like, even Great Britain, even the king was like, we do want everyone to be able to pray to God. Like, we don't want to deny people access to God. That's not going to get us into heaven. <laughs> um, so... Uh, that eventually the Bishop of Canterbury, he, he does a quasi-legal ordination of Mason Weems and several other people, at which point Weems returns to the United States and helps to organize not just the Episcopal religion, but uh, the, or denomination I should say, but uh, reorganize religion in the United States. Because there was, in the 1780s, 
after the American Revolution, there was an upheaval in religion uh, and, and essentially a reorganization of how all religion operated. Not how it views, not necessarily the practice of religion, not people's beliefs, although, you know, they were changing at the time. We were about to hit the Second Great Awakening, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, but as they, literally the, the practice of it. You know, over the next few decades, uh, this is still a time where even though the, the First Amendment to the Constitution says freedom of religion, uh, you know, that's in the United States, but you still, certain states still had state religions, and you still had to pay, part of your taxes were tithes to one particular church. It's go on for a while in many places. Uh, notably, Connecticut uh, had a state religion until like 1816, 1817, when uh, 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 Theodore, the, uh, what's his name, something Parsons, uh, started the toler Toleration Party. Uh, and that the Toleration Party simply wanted... Uh, I believe I believe Connecticut was Congregationalist, and you were, your taxes went to the Congregationalists, and there were Episcopalians who were like, well, no, I don't want my tax money to go to a church I don't believe in. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, 30 years after the, after the Constitution was ratified, and the Bill of Rights was ratified. So, it lasted a little while. Anyway... Mason Weems comes back to the United States and he says, okay, well, I'm going to be a preacher now. And he starts being called Pass, uh, uh, Parson, Parson Weems. Uh, it becomes more his regular, better known moniker. Parson Weems essentially becomes a traveling itinerant uh, uh, preacher. He does have a family. He has a lot of kids with his wife, uh, but he travels a lot, goes out into the countryside uh, talking to people, preaching, and eventually to support his income, he starts selling books also. So he becomes a traveling preacher slash book salesman, uh, going out into the country where, you know, books weren't necessarily so readily available, and he would sell his wares uh, and preach his preachings, and he became pretty well known for it. Eventually, he gets to, uh, he decides to publish a book. See, George Washington passes away in 1789, uh, 1799. And just the following year, there was kind of a rush to idolize Washington. And the following year, Weems publishes his first book, a biography about Washington, entitled A History of the Life and Death, Virtues and Exploits of General George Washington. And this is at a time where, while there were historians coming around and people were starting to take history, uh, historical accuracy very seriously, wasn't necessary to sell books yet. Uh, and you could make things up if you wanted to. And in his first book, he only doesn't make up that much, but he lionizes Washington. The point of this first edition was to, you know, be like, the great general hero of America is dead, and this is the life he led. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, he publishes on a new edition every year, and in 1805, he publishes a fifth edition. And the fifth edition is the first time we see a story that he heard from a woman who heard from someone else, who heard one time that maybe... George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. And when confronted by his father about chopping down this cherry tree, he said, I cannot tell a lie. Uh, and I forget the exact quote, but I cut down the cherry tree. Whoopsie daisy. Uh, give me my punishment, essentially. We all know the cherry tree story. And at this point, it's pretty well known that the cherry tree story was probably a fabrication. Um, uh, Mason Weems heard it from a story from a heard it from a story from a heard it from a story and put it in the book and then it became wildly famous and i mean mason weems's version i you know when i was doing my research i, I read something like probably most of what abraham lincoln learned as a kid about george washington came from the weems book and most of what most of america learned from george washington because it became a bestseller so most of what america learned about george washington in the 1810s 20s 30s 40s the, they, Weems was the most popular biographer of Washington. So, this this cherry tree story that we all know and love, while we know now today, uh, uh, probably didn't happen. That's he's the reason we all think it happened. I should say, uh, I heard um, I voted for George, and they accepted. Uh, so, how do I say this? Uh, uh, I believe it was. Henry Adams uh, said something once that there's no way to definitely it's absolutely possible that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree and told his father he could not tell a lie. 
absolutely could have happened. There was very little chance that that happened. <laughs> because why wouldn't he lie about cutting down the tree? He was a reasonable person. <laughs> I, I do want to note also, this is not the only biography that Weems wrote. Weems actually ended up writing several books, including one about Benjamin Franklin, because he tried to ride the high of George Washington, is you know, his George Washington book. But he also wrote a biography of Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. And this book also got a lot of publication. And it's interesting, as I was saying before about Robert Kirkwood, like most of the the generals, while we do remember a lot of the the, the um, soldiers of the American Revolution as best we can, not all of them are all that famous. Not all of them have like TV shows with what John Wayne in them, right? Or no, it wasn't even John Wayne. It was it was, was it Leslie Nielsen? Not all of them get TV shows and movies throughout the 19th century. Uh, the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion does, and a lot of the reason for his fame is because Mason Weems was riding the popularity of his Washington book when he put out the Swamp Fox book, and it certainly helped make this a bigger, more popular character. So while he may have made up a long-standing fib about George Washington, uh, we do definitely want to give him credit for giving him, uh, really giving Francis Marion the popularity he still carries and still deserves to this day. So thanks, Mason Weems. Good job on that one. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, George was super young when his dad died, but that's the thing about the cherry tree story.